Hello and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. Today's episode is going to be about understanding blood types, the ABO and RH groups. There are so many misconceptions about blood typing. Oh my gosh, you can eat based on your blood type. You can check this out. You can find your perfect match based on your blood type. It's really pretty ridiculous, but you know, a lot of people are confused because historically people had to have blood tests before marriage. Um, in truth, this really didn't have that much to do with blood types as much as it had to do with disease, especially diseases like syphilis. But it accounts for a lot of the confusion that goes on about blood groups, and there are many blood groups. Certainly the most important and the focus of this video, the ABO blood group and the RH group. Interestingly enough, we share the ABO and RH blood groups with our relatives, apes, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. Okay, so students are totally plagued by these uh, donor recipient tables and they think that they have to memorize all this. For heaven's sakes, don't do that. That's what the Penguin Prof is for. Okay, we're going to go through what all of this stuff means so that it makes sense to you and then you don't have to memorize anything. Um, one quick request, if you can, please donate and give the gift of life. One blood donation can save several people. Just a tiny bit of history here. These blood groups were discovered in around 1900 by Carl Landsteiner. He wondered why some people were saved as a result of blood transfusion, but some patients died. And uh, boy, that's, I think, a really good question. He received the Nobel Prize for this work in 1930. Blood types are inherited genetic traits, so they're just like all the other things that we inherit, which does, again, make me think about this date by type thing. What if I can come up with a match by earlobe type? I mean, that makes about as much sense. Anyway, the thing that's confusing is that blood typing, the ABO system, is not inherited in Mendelian fashion. So uh, it gets a little bit complicated because we have three alleles, and don't worry, we're going to go through that. I'm going to have an analogy here. A red blood cells look a little bit like donuts. Of course, they don't have the hole in the middle. They have a little depression. But my ABO analogy, we're going to look at donuts and sprinkles, okay? And uh, hopefully, we'll make some sense of this. Now, some people have donuts that have on their surface little sprinkles that look like A's. Okay, just go with me on this. We're going to call those people type A. Some people have donuts that have sprinkles on them that are little B's, and we're going to call those people type B. Some people have donuts, and they're kind of greedy. They like it all, so they have both A and B sprinkles on top. We're going to call those people AB. And some people don't have any sprinkles at all. They are sprinkle challenged. They are the plain donuts. We call those people type O. That causes some confusion because some people think that there are O sprinkles, okay, but there aren't. Oh, by the way, different parts of the world, you may actually see this as type zero, which actually makes more sense. Okay, no extra sprinkles. These are the ABO phenotypes. These are the traits that individuals can express. So what this analogy means is that, of course, the donuts are the blood cells and the sprinkles are antigens. Antigens on the cell surface, and we designate the different antigens as either A or B. So the A people have A antigens on the surface of their cells. The B people have B antigens on the surface of their cells. The A and B people, of course, have both, and the plain donuts have neither A nor B. But what do the antigens really look like? Um, your textbooks in general biology and introductory physiology probably don't show you, but this is the Penguin Prof channel, so you're going to get a little bit more out of me. This is the idea. I'm showing you only the carbohydrate portion of the antigen, so there's another section that kind of anchors the thing into the cell membrane. The plain donut has a sequence that looks like this. That's the base unit. For people with A sprinkles, A antigens, at the end of the base, you add one more unit. It's called N-acetylgalactosamine, and that's what it really looks like. People with B sprinkles, the B antigen, instead of adding that, you add a galactose, which looks like this. Now, when you look at these, 
you'll notice that they're very similar in structure. This is an acetaminophen group and this is a hydroxyl group. Even though they look similar though, chemically they are very different. They have different properties. This group is a hydrogen bond acceptor while the hydroxyl group is a hydrogen bond donor. So the point is that they do have different chemical properties even though they do look rather similar. Okay, so the alleles in the ABO system, they're encoded here at the long arm on chromosome 9. And this, again, is not an example of Mendelian inheritance. So it might be a little confusing. There's actually three alleles that we worry about. But don't worry, we're going to go through it all. We're going to use a lowercase i to code for the base, that plain donut, okay? We're going to use a capital I with a superscript A for the A antigen. So that's the plain donut and then add the N-acetylgalactosamine. And then finally, the third allele we have is the B antigen. So we're going to take that base unit, the plain donut, and we're going to add galactose. Those are the three alleles we have. So when you combine the three alleles, we're going to make all four blood group phenotypes. I know you want to see how this works. So four different possibilities. I'm reminding you again what this looks like. We're talking about A people. They have the A sprinkles. There are two ways that someone could inherit the A phenotype or the A blood group. You can be homozygous for A, and this means that both parents gave you this allele. So you inherited two copies of the information to make the A sprinkles. But you could also inherit only one copy. So one parent gave you the information to make A sprinkles. The other parent just gave you the plain donut information. Either way, if you're homozygous or heterozygous, you're going to be blood type A. Same thing is true for people who are blood type B. There are two ways to be B. You can be homozygous for B because both parents gave you the information to make B sprinkles, or you can be heterozygous for B. Only one parent gave you the information. If your blood type is AB, there's only one genotype that is possible. One parent had to give the information to make A antigens, A sprinkles, and the other parent had to give information to make B sprinkles. This, by the way, is a great example of why the ABO inheritance is an example of co-dominance, why it's non-Mendelian, because A isn't dominant over B or vice versa. So that's a really cool thing to notice. If you are blood type O, there's only one genotype that encodes the plain donuts. You had to get two copies of that little I. And that's how you inherit the four blood groups. Now, one more thing we need to understand before we talk about transfusions and who's allowed to donate to whom, and that has to do with antibodies. So we've been talking about A and B antigens. These are particles on the cell surface, and you have tons of them, okay, not just the A or B. The body is full of antigens. They help cells to identify each other, and many antigens are what we call self-antigens. They identify you as you. The problem comes if you are exposed to foreign antigens, strangers. If you're exposed to antigens that are not native to you, your body is designed to make antibodies against them. So you make antibodies against foreign antigens. That's the key. If you've never seen antibodies before, this is what they look like. There's this hypervariable region. This is the part here, as you can see, that binds with the antigen. It's very much like how a key fits a lock. The idea is that if you are exposed to antigens that are foreign to you, you'll make antibodies against them. If antigens and antibodies come together, you get a reaction called agglutination. And this is what normal blood should look like on a microscope slide. You notice it looks very, very nice and, and all the cells are evenly spread out. But in agglutination, the particles clump together. And that nice, fluid, liquid blood can become more like a solid and form clots. And this is bad. And this is why understanding blood types is essential when you're talking about transfusions and why this table exists. But now we get to the point where you don't have to memorize this anymore. All you have to understand is that no foreign antigens are allowed. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all four blood types types, we're going to mix them with the other blood types, and we're going to understand what happens and why some mixes are allowed and some are not. So for a person who has antigen A, the B antigen is foreign, and they have antibodies against the B antigen. So we're going to mix this blood with blood type A, and of course there's no problem, right? That's their blood type. 
But if that A person gets transfused with a blood sample that contains B antigens, you got a problem because that B antigen will combine with the anti-B antibodies and the blood clump. So that is not allowed. If you transfuse with AB blood, that's also a problem. The A is okay, but remember they have B too. So that B is bad and causes the blood to clump. Now, why can you transfuse an A person with O blood? The answer hopefully makes sense to you now. This O is the plain donut. It doesn't have any antigens, so you don't make antibodies against it. So O blood is okay, perfectly fine. What about B blood? Now, the person that has B antigens is sensitive to and makes antibodies against A antigens. So if you have a B patient and you transfuse A blood, not good, you're gonna get clumping. A B person with B blood obviously is okay, that's their blood type. AB is not okay because that A is foreign. And O blood is fine, that's just a plain donut. What about AB? The AB person has antigens A and B, and so they don't make antibodies against either. So AB blood can be transfused with all four blood types because they got it all. What about O? O individuals have antibodies against the A antigen because those are foreign and the B antigen because those are foreign too. So you can't give an O person A blood and you can't give an O person B blood or AB blood. Oh my gosh, that's a double whammy. You can only give O blood to an O person. So all that you have to remember is that you can't give foreign antigens to someone. And it should make sense now that the type AB is the universal recipient because you can't give them anything that they don't already have. And type O is the universal donor because they are the plain donuts and they don't excite anybody's immune system. Okay, all we got left is the RH antigen, sometimes called the D antigen. This one's going to be really easy because it's inherited in Mendelian fashion. And by the way, named for the rhesus macaque in which a lot of early studies were done. The RH antigen is inherited in Mendelian fashion. You'll be excited to know that. If you're not excited, I have a video on Mendelian genetics, fun with cats and peas. So if I run through this a little bit fast and you're confused with the vocabulary, check that out. I'll put the link in the description bar below. We're going to look at the different options. There are only three, as is typical for Mendelian genetics. Individuals who are homozygous dominant, capital R, capital R, they express the Rh antigen on their red blood cells. Individuals who are heterozygous, right, that dominant one will mask the recessive one. Those individuals are also Rh positive. The only way to not express the Rh antigen is to be homozygous recessive. Um, these are the different possibilities, and I just wrote them out so you can see that only individuals who are homozygous recessive will not express the Rh antigen on their blood cells. Everybody else will. Now, the medical importance of this is shown here. If you have an Rh negative woman and an Rh positive man, and they conceive a child. Oh, look, she's so cute. She's all like cuddly up against him. He's so positive. Anyway, so um, I made them both homozygous for their respective Rh types. So she's homozygous recessive. He's homozygous dominant. Their fetus will be heterozygous. So now look at what's happening. You have an Rh negative woman carrying an Rh positive fetus. Now, antibodies flow in one direction from the mother's body across the placenta to the fetus. So it seems a little strange that the Rh antigen being expressed on the fetal red blood cells is not in a sense seen by the mother's body. So usually that doesn't occur until the last trimester or usually birth where there is hemorrhaging and the mixing of blood. And at that point, the mother's body sees the Rh antigen for the first time. And you know what happens when you get a foreign antigen? You make antibodies against it. So from here on out, the mother will make antibodies against the Rh antigen. 
for the rest of her life. She is what we call sensitized. Now, up to this point, there's actually no problem. The problem comes in subsequent pregnancies. If this RH negative woman conceives another RH positive child, now the situation is different because she is sensitized against RH and the antibodies that she makes will flow across the placenta to the fetus and will cause what is called rhesus disease or hemolytic disease of the newborn. And that can be catastrophic. Now there's good news. Um, The percent of individuals on the planet who are RH negative is relatively small. These are data from the US, but it's similar around the world. There's even more good news though. Um, There is a treatment called Rogam. You can see here when it is administered and this will actually bind up and block the mother's antibodies and prevent them from binding to the blood cells of the fetus. So um, that's really good news. A lot of information. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. As always, I ask for your support. Please click those buttons, like, share, and subscribe. Join me on Facebook, follow on Twitter. Good luck.